and we are recording. All right, thank you, Stephanie, and welcome everybody to the April 28th, 2023 meeting of the Town of Amherst Solar Bylaw Working Group. Um, we do have a quorum, um, presume, yeah. Um, and um, uh, we have our agenda. Let me just ask before we start going down the agenda, uh, Stephanie, was the idea was really to kick off with with um, uh, Adrian to to um, uh, use her time wisely as opposed yes, to, I, yeah, exactly. I think okay. that would just be considerate of yeah. Adrian's time. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> um, okay, so um, let me um, just pull up the agenda. Okay, great. So, um, and, and just for for the rest of us, we have six uh, folks from the uh, public that have joined us at this point. Uh, so, thank you, uh, everybody uh, that has joined us uh, from the uh, from the general public. Appreciate your interest and attendance. Um, and we will certainly have opportunity for public comment later in the agenda. Um, so with that, let me um, um, pass it over to Adrian uh, Dunk from GZA. Um, she's obviously talked to us before, so she doesn't need an introduction, um, but uh, she's going to um, present to us the um, the results uh, and, and findings from the town um, outreach uh, efforts. So thank you, Adrian. Great, thank you, Dwayne. I'm happy to be back and share these results. Right, I am sharing my screen. And um, so I'm here to share the results of our public outreach efforts for this townwide solar assessment. Um, I've previously been before you to share the um, map-based assessment results. So this is the, the second half of our effort. Um, today's presentation has quite a few numbers and statistics in it, but um, there are more in the report, which will be forthcoming. So not every piece of data is in this presentation. Um, I think that would make it a little too lengthy. Um, so, so we're just going to hit some of the high points here. All right, so overall, we had um, really good engagement across the town. We got 16 responses on the Engage Amherst site, as well as two additional emailed sets of responses into um, Stephanie. We had 508 people respond to the public survey, and um, we did host two interactive workshops. They were the same, and total we had about 30 participants. Um, there were many more participants at our Saturday workshop than our um, evening workshop, but we did, we did have attendees at both. Um, so on our Engage Amherst website, we, we asked, you know, what are you most excited or concerned about? And we asked that really throughout our survey process um, to try to just understand um, broadly what people were thinking and feeling about solar development. And so our responses fell into one of three categories um, broadly. So things people were excited about were, were solar generally um, heading to net zero, using roofs and parking lots first. And also um, people were excited about the social implications and the level of engagement across town um, and really being a model town for um, this transition to, to renewable energy. Um, the next category was concerns. And so there were concerns about agricultural and forest conversion, which we did anticipate. And some of these concerns were voiced mildly and some were very strong. So there, there were a range of um, how strongly people felt. Um, but other concerns that were raised were related to pricing and logistics for the town. Um, and also some, some concern that there may be underutilization of existing tools that could help um, increase solar uptake. Um, and finally, some people did include kind of what they wanna see more of, which I think is, is great. And so um, there was calls for more consultation um, with farmers and foresters as there's discussion of farm and forest land. And um, throughout the process, there were um, requests for more education on, on ongoing developments and also solar options and an interest in seeing more decentralized solar installations um, versus fewer large scale. Um, 
Next, we'll go through our survey responses. And before we do, I want to start with some of the demographics. Um, so 95% of our respondents were homeowners. Um, most of them are single family homeowners, but we had about 10% um, who own condos or multifamily homes. Um, and then the remaining 5% of respondents were renters. Respondents also skewed towards longer term residents. As you can see, um, you know, 93% of our respondents um, have been here at least two years. Um, but most have really been here 10 years or more, um, with very few respondents being new to town. Interestingly, 2% don't live in town. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm glad we had that option to, to capture this demographic. These people may um, work in town or own businesses in town or just be interested in solar regionally. Um, and then our respondents did, did skew older, with our largest proportion being um, greater than 65 years old. Um, and, and second, most common respondents were 45 to 65 years old. Um, so very few young respondents, but we did have a few actually that were under 18. So, so some engagement of the high school crowd. Um, we asked generally on our community survey about attitudes. So um, we did ask who was aware of the town emission targets and about 60% of people coming to the survey were aware that the town had goals. So that means that the, the survey was a teaching tool um, for 40% of respondents about the, the state and the town um, targets. And even though 40% of people just learned about the targets because they were taking the survey, um, almost 90% of our respondents thought that um, greenhouse gas emission reduction goals are important or very important. Um, we then also asked our respondents kind of what they think the top benefits of solar are, and there were many, um, many options to choose from. The top three were really reducing fossil fuels, balancing renewables with natural areas, and slowing climate change. Um, and then on the top concerns, you see again, um, this, this common theme of conversion of forest land, conversion of farmland, and upfront or initial costs. Um, our survey asked about small scale development. Um, and so this is primarily about residential area. Um, and you can see that um, almost that a little bit more than half of our respondents use solar in some some capacity. Um, so this this is very encouraging, but we also do note that um, respondents to the survey are likely people already more interested in solar than maybe the general public. Um, so so thirty five percent of our respondents have solar on their roof, but there are others in town who have selected renewable energy through their utility or are a community solar member. Um, for the Did 47 you ask, I'm sorry, uh, sorry to interrupt. Um, I do see Jack has his hand up. I'm wondering if you might oh. answer a few questions along the way. Sure, yes. I um, can't see you all. So if you can okay. just um, direct that traffic, Dwayne, I would appreciate that. I yes, can. hi. Um, I just, I was wondering, you know, you show, you're showing percentages. Uh, so I, I missed, uh, what were the total number of respondents? And so then some by, of the percentages, uh, I'm a little confused whether that's a subset of, of, you know, there was one uh, slide back there that, you know, a portion was feeling one way, and then there was a percentage. So was it a percentage for the people that answered positively, or was it, you know, a percentage of the total respondents sort of thing? So, um, those yeah, are absolutely. Words. So 508 people took the survey. Um, None of our questions were required, so not everyone answered every question. Um, but in general, there were at least 480 responses to each question. Um, so some of our questions were, um, so here in terms of like 88% thinking the targets are important, that, that would be out of 100%. So this was one where people answered, you know, agree, Strongly agree, agree, neutral, disagree, strongly disagree. Um, okay, so the, and then the 28% is of the 100% or of the 88%? Oh, 
Okay, so then these are are of um, total number of responses. So, so the benefits and concerns here were select up to three. So, what are your top three concerns? Okay, okay. And so, um, for twenty one percent of respondents, reducing fossil fuels is a top benefit. And so the percentages are out of different um, different totals because sometimes we let people select one or uh, multiple options. And then um, later on, there was one where we let people select all that apply. So um, you could select up to seven options on that one. Okay. Uh, so these are these are the top. So these were the, the, the most selected options. Um, uh, so I can, I can call that out as we go through. And that is, um, you know, in the report, it has the question. So it's, it's, it's a bit more clear about, you know, that people could select up to three here. Um, but the total divisor number does change per question just based on uh, how many responses there were. And then, you know, how many people answered, and then also how many options they selected. All right, I appreciate that, thank you. Absolutely. Um, so right here, do you use solar at your residence? You could only select <clears throat> one option. Um, so, so we do see quite a bit of solar use by our respondents. Um, we then asked if you said no. So our 47% of people who said no, um, we asked, you know, why don't you? And um, here they could select multiple options because it, it could be compounding factors. Um, and so the most selected options for why people don't have solar installed at their homes yet were um, that their, their home or yard doesn't have adequate solar exposure for solar um, panels and or that the upfront costs of insulation are too high. Um, and then 16%, I think it's still pretty significant, said that the overall um, process is just too confusing. So here there can be um, plenty of interplay between these options. Um, but I think there's, there's opportunity here for um, the town and, and maybe your group and or ECAC to um, develop some education or um, there was a request by someone to have a list of approved solar installers um, that could potentially make the process a little bit less confusing. Um, we also asked for, for com uh, about community development, community solar. And so this was a very broad hypothetical, you know, would you be interested in purchasing shares of a community solar project? Um, we're obviously not proposing a specific project, so, so there are no uh, details to share. But we do see that most respondents said that they, they would be interested either strongly or, or probably yes, um, and then 30% would need more information, which is entirely understandable. Um, and then a pretty clear outcome here, should the town assess lower income individuals in developing solar on their property with 74% um, of respondents saying yes. Okay, so this um, question was one of the ones that said that, that asked our users to rank. So you could um, drag and drop to rank where, what land type you would most like to see solar on. So each of these bars does add up to 100. So the most preferred locations we can see are canopy in blue and rooftop in yellow. And so those um, canopies most preferred, but rooftops pretty close second. Um, and if you see those, those add up to pretty similar total percentage of votes. Um, once the built environment was exhausted in, in the first and second, most preferred uh, slots. We see that semi-developed um, was really the broad third choice, um, representing 81% of third choices. And we had um, defined semi-developed in the survey to include, um, in, include areas like medians and next to roadways, um, 
maybe in parks that but associated with existing infrastructure so not um, open meadows and not um, you know intact forest lands or conservation lands or anything like that these were um, semi-developed um, as a fourth choice that's where you see it start to be mixed there's there's about 60% who voted for agricultural fields at that point and another 30 um, for open space. And here that open space does include forest land. So that was, that was clearly included in the question. Um, but broadly agricultural fields would be more preferred than um, forest and other open space um, from this question. From there, because we did expect to see pretty broad support for development of the built environment. Um, I mean, Janet, Janet, yeah, go ahead, Janet. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, Adrian, do you mind if we go back to the, the previous um, thing? So, sure. I, I, you know, I don't remember the survey. I have it somewhere in piles of paper. So open space and semi, so open space included forest land? Yes. And then fields? Like what was included? In, there was no like forest question, right? It wasn't broken out as far as so. That what was is, on the next question. So this was just looking at, yeah, use of of land in very broad categories. And so it did say, you know, open space, i.e., you know, forest, meadows, um, and the semi-developed okay. did did say, you know, associated with existing buildings. Okay, so the forest and the meadows would be an open space. So it was so agricultural fields and open space, including forests and fields, were the least preferred over 85% of the people that chose that as their least preferred. Is that am I reading that right? Right. So yeah, most okay. people chose those as their least preferred when looking at the environment um, holistically. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to okay. Um, and that that was an anticipated result. We know that the town that in the town there's broad support for using the built environment first. Um, so we did ask that question to confirm what we what we anticipated. Um, and then we asked this secondary question, which was asking um, users to rank where they most prefer large developments on the unbuilt environment. And so here the unbuilt environment was divided up. Um, a little bit more finely than on the, pr the previous question, um, because the intent here was to go a little bit deeper. Um, so here we see that respondents um, primarily would look to dual use agriculture first. That's their most preferred use of the unbuilt environment. Um, though 31% of respondents did say that they, they would most prefer no development on the unbuilt environment at all. Um, and I'm sure you all remember there was discussion in, in writing that question about, um, you know, including a statement about knowing that, that climate change is occurring, where, where would you most prefer to see solar development? And, and with that clause included in the intro, we did see 31% say um, no development on the unbuilt environment. But most, most Respondents um, most most preferred the dual use agriculture, and then their second choice was really um, traditional use of agricultural fields for solar or dual use. Um, and so we see we see the agricultural component um, present really in the first through third choices, and forest land, which is yellow, doesn't show up as a as a larger component of preference um, until really the fourth and, and fifth choice. Um, throughout that whole category, open space um, was there. And so open space here was um, clarified as, you know, meadows, non-forests. Um, Go ahead, Janet. So I that was actually, maybe you anticipated it. So when I'm looking at this chart, I see that um, the open space was to just meadows was like, you know, it's 15% as most preferred, and then it drops down to 27%. Okay, so, okay. All right. And then, okay, I'm just, it's a, this is sort of a confusing chart for me, but 
there was a lot of data, you know, to ask people what, what they prefer and ranking. Um, and so it does take, you know, it, it certainly takes a little bit of looking at and thinking through to, um, yeah, I, I to actually, interpret. I struggled with the no development as the most preferred and the least preferred in a funny way. Like, does that make sense? Like, so most people preferred like 31%, am I reading? They preferred mm -hmm. no development and then the, then 34% least preferred no development or do you know what I mean? Yeah. So I, um, the users who, what this represents, um, to me or how I interpret this is, is. 31% said no development, but then for the 34, where it's at the bottom, um, right? Because it was a ranking and you had to put them in order, that is, you know, is they want development of some kind. They want solar over no solar, um, would be what that 34% at the bottom is saying, is you know, that I given their druthers, they would like to see solar on these other landscape types. Um, Okay. We're seeing no development. I, I just found that confusing. What I actually, when I answered this question, you know, instead of just reading it and thinking about it, I struggled with it because I had two, two like that were equally weighted. And I was like, well, which one do I put first? And so, you know, I, I think I would have preferred to say here are my two most preferred and yet not particularly ranking them, but just giving an opinion. So I had a thing where I just sort of sat there and I froze and I'm like, oh, I don't want solar here. I do want it here. don't want it here and here. And now I have to pick. And, you know, so I guess it was a forced ranking, but it was just the the, the survey forced you to make a choice that I wouldn't have made. So I just wanted to earmark that as a possible conflict, but okay. All right. Um, and, and Stephanie? Yeah, I was just going to um, also ask Adrian for clarification that the results will also have a narrative to support these charts so that people aren't just left looking at the charts to figure this all out. There's going to be an explanation of what all this means. Thank you. Right, so there'll be some 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 more information about the charts. I mean, we specifically are, you know, our purpose in this with the town was to conduct the survey and to share the results. So, so we are not making, you know, conclusions or recommendations about what the town should or shouldn't do with this data, how, you know, they should or shouldn't um, interpret and apply it. We're really here to, to share what the community responded with. Uh, sorry, let's go with Jack before we, uh, on okay. this slide. Well, I, I just wanted to say, I, I think this is fascinating with the point that Janet pointed <laughs> out uh, with, you know, a third that, you know, prefer uh, no development and then a third that, you know, like the, pros the prospect of, of no development, uh, the least. And then there's another third that are in the middle. <laughs> um, I just want to say, I, I wonder, you know, I'm wondering about the third. If we just took the third that that were not included in the the top 31 and the bottom 34, I'm wondering what what that graph would look like. I guess because they they seem to be more in the middle. I guess. Yeah, to track to that solar. that middle third and see what they where they draw the line. Yes, because they seem to be more the undecided. You know, mm -hmm. but. Um, I just wanted to mention that. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, these results. Um, I mean, we're we're going through them pretty pretty quickly here, but um, the more time you spend looking at these graphs, yeah, the there's some really great questions and some some really interesting information in them. Um, as we continued through the, the large scale development, we asked several um, hypothetical questions about, um, you know, possible items you all may be considering in the bylaw. Um, and so I didn't include them all here because it is, it is a lot of information. Um, but I wanted to highlight something that, that stood out to me when looking at this that I thought was, was pretty interesting. 
Um, so this top one was about if the bylaw should create, um, you know, strict regulations on where solar can be constructed. And we see about 75% of respondents um, agreed or strongly agreed uh, with that statement. But the next statement, which is about if the bylaw should create a new layer of review, you know, or a new process, um, in addition to what the town currently uses, that amount of agreement really dropped down um, to about 50%. So still, you know, significant uh, support, but, but markedly less than um, creating, you know, regulations on where the solar goes. And the, we actually see that same pattern in the bottom. We asked some questions where agreeing was, um, you know, more restrictions and some where agreeing was fewer restrictions. Um, and so here again, we see the question of um, solar projects should be reviewed the same as other land developments. And about 40% um, said, yep, it should be reviewed the same as, as other developments. Um, and when we said there should be no additional zoning regulations, only 20% agreed. So we see that pattern here where maybe the people feel there's a pretty robust review process, but maybe there should be more clear um, requirements um, on where the zoning goes uh, or where, where the solar goes within a site. Um, and then I did include these two in the middle um, because there was broad support for those as well, which is that the um, agreeing with the statement that the bylaw should set a progressive level of review so that larger projects receive more oversight than smaller projects and that there should be a minimum size that's regulated by the bylaw. So projects under a, a given threshold um, would just go through regular processes that currently exist um, without new requirements. So there's a lot to tease out here, but but those were a couple of um, striking patterns to me um, between the two top and the two bottom questions on on delving into um, regulations on site configuration versus process. Um, as we move into the municipal projects, you know, when the town considers its own future projects, um, we ask the public, when would you like to be informed about the project? And this was a select all that apply because, you know, some people may want to be engaged throughout the entire process and want updates and want to, you know, attend meetings and, and others may only want to be involved at, at certain phases. So here these percents are, you know, the total number who selected that item out of the total number of respondents. Um, and so we do see that about half of respondents really want to be informed up front. They want to know about the project really as soon as it's conceived, as soon as the site's been selected, when there's a conceptual plan. Um, there's maybe a little bit less interest in uh, when the grants are applied for, when the funding's secured, but then that interest ticks back up when there's a, a actual development plan, there's a design, and it's going through permitting. Um, I thought this was interesting too, kind of throughout the survey, we see about five to seven percent of respondents saying, I'm not interested in solar, I'm not interested in being involved in this process, I don't have a preference on where it goes. So I did think it was interesting that, um, you know, seven percent of, of 500, it's about 35 people took the survey to say, don't involve me. Um, so that, I don't, I think it's interesting um, that they cared enough to, to participate. Um, and we also asked, what are your, you know, what do you want to know? When the town is, is proposing a new solar development, what information do you want to know? Um, and so the, to the most selected options were People wanted to know how this project would advance the town's climate goals. They also wanted to know about the responsibility for the long-term maintenance and decommissioning of the project. Um, and then they want to know finally how much the project will cost the town and how much um, it will save the town. Um, so then that, that was the survey questions. Um, 
we also had our interactive workshop and I know several of you attended, which was great. Um, so the first activity we called it, how do you feel? And um, participants based on different um, pictures of different types of solar development could um, submit feeling words. Um, and so this is to get a general idea um, in a pretty, pretty inclusive and simple way. Um, and so the first was um, cutting forests for solar development. And we do see that most participants um, responded here that they were angry or worried, um, maybe sad and frustrated. Um, interestingly, there's four participants who were happy or neutral. And, and I think this must be happy about the panels um, and maybe neutral about the trees, but uh, I suspect not, not happy to see the trees go. Uh, the second option was dual use. And here we see, again, um, most people were pretty happy with dual use. Um, there was a lot of interest about dual use, a lot of questions um, during the workshops about it. And we see that reflected in the you know, curious, um, maybe some cautious. There, there were some definitely, I guess, opportunity for, for education around what is dual use and what would qualify. The traditional um, you know, single use of ag land for solar had really mixed responses. Uh, so here you'll notice that the Y axis is much smaller. It's only out of uh, five instead of out of these other ones are out of 12. Um, and that's because there just was a lot more diversity of, of answers here. Um, so the town is pretty split on, on use of ag land. And then canopy, um, I don't think anyone will be surprised to see that most people were excited or happy um, to see canopy. Um, and then relieved and curious were some other, other options. There were a few questions about um, that, that during the workshop that I received about canopy generally, how it's done and, and what its limitations are, but generally um, seemed like there was a lot of consensus that that's a great use of space. Um, again, we asked people here to, to prioritize based on this graphic where they'd like to see solar. Um, and so we see canopy and rooftop really, really topping the charts as the most preferred, um, most highly prioritized sites um, with dual use and um, coming in third. And then a, a fair amount of interest in ground mounted, but not forest. Um, there are also some other kind of write-in comments in here about preferences. And so all those write-in comments are included in the report. Um, this was an open-ended activity where people could write down questions they have about solar generally, um, and then solar and Amherst um, and some development related questions. So we did see again, right? How can the town make sure to prioritize rooftops first? Um, where is financial support? We see, I saw consistently through here questions about how is this being funded? Um, and then questions again, like what, what about homes that aren't in the best location for solar? Um, which leads right into the next one, which is how does community solar work? Uh, so some questions around that and what people can do if they can't support it on their home. Um, I know the ECAC is working on understanding how many megawatts we as a community use, and then how much area do we really need to meet that goal? Um, and then some questions about what bylaws do we need? Um, and I know you all are working diligently on that. Uh, there was also statements about thinking of Amherst as a region and not just the town of Amherst, um, and, and thinking about how Amherst could work with Hadley, um, how there were some pointed questions about using the Hampshire Mall parking lots for solar, um, questions about protection of private wells, and then calls for just more coordination um, in town and also between towns and with the state. Uh, this was uh, Sunny Days and Rain Clouds was another open-ended um, activity where people could write down, you know, free form what they, what their hopes and concerns related to solar are. And so we see Again, just a lot of excitement about solar. You know, Happy Our Community is doing what it can for now and for the future, weaning ourselves off fossil fuels. Um, 
but also some hopes maybe for um, requiring bonds from developers and, and putting in safeguards so that um, as projects move forward, there's um, recourse to make sure they're built in sensitive, environmentally sensitive ways. Um, and then again, looking, looking for funding and support from outside of town to develop parking lots. The rain clouds, I think is really interesting and it highlights the balancing act that, that this whole transition to renewables necessitates. So we had, you know, one participant say careless or hasty decisions they're really worried about and somebody else said, well, we're, we're not moving fast enough. Um, we see concerns related to forest and farmland use impacts on aquifer and others saying, you know, I don't want to put too many restrictions on it. So um, I think this really, really highlights the tightrope that we as a society are walking and that you all are trying to strike with the bylaw to, um, you know, facilitate this transition while, while protecting the landscapes and resources in town. Um, we also asked broadly, oh, I see Jack, your hands up. Yeah, I was just wondering the, the, the impact on groundwater and aquifer. I'm just wondering, you know, we did the white paper. I'm just wondering uh, where that comes from. I, I'm wondering uh, because uh, do you do you have any? Did you gather what that reference specifically? Um, we we didn't, and we are you know we're just kind of conveying what. What, what the concerns were said. We're not, you know, agreeing or disagreeing with them. Um, so it may just be that the, maybe there needs to be, you know, broader dissemination of the white paper um, because in multiple avenues, drinking water was, was raised as a concern. Um, hmm. So it's certainly out there in the community. Okay, it seems like we need to do a better job of, of presenting the, the results of that then. Um, so, right, we asked, um, you know, a broad-based values question. So on, on this one and the next question, we had a few uh, seed ideas and then people could also write in and add their own. Um, and so here we see that people really value you know, diverse wildlife um, had the most votes by itself. But if you also include, you know, conservation had a lot of votes. And I, I just personally love this. Somebody wrote in salamanders and that garnered additional votes. Um, so there's um, obviously a lot of appreciation for the natural environment in Amherst. Um, but fresh fruit and agriculture are well represented, as well as um, appreciating that they People live in a strong community um, with great neighbors and, and have a good education system and, and value equity. Um, so those were all, all pretty highly rated. Um, Jack, is your hand back up or is it still up? Put it down, sorry. Oh, okay. Just wanted to make sure I wasn't I wasn't missing anything. I can't see everyone, but I can see when uh, when your hand goes up. And then our final question was, um, we called it reasonable requirements. And it was, again, very broad statements for people to kind of agree with, um, you know, or to, to upvote or to not vote for. Um, these were kept intentionally broad to avoid any implication that these are, these are in the bylaw or have been decided on already. Um, so, so they were pretty, pretty wide open. Um, and so we do see um, a lot of votes for requiring solar on non-residential buildings and on new parking lots, but nobody wrote in or voted for um, requirements related to new residential construction. Um, so I do know one of our Engage Amherst questions was concerned about new requirements for residences and homeowners. And um, so we don't, we don't see anybody volunteering that, that option here. Um, and again, there's multiple, as this was a write-in, um, there are multiple variations on, on tree removal. And so quite a few votes for, you know, either not clear cutting forests or for um, only allowing limited tree removal or 
no tree removal. So some, some variation on where people's thresholds are, but uh, support for limiting, limiting overall tree removal. I'm sorry. And that is Jan, that's all yeah. of the Great. Um, questions. I know it was a lot. So as Stephanie said, we are um, finalizing our report and that report will have all of these results and more results in there. Um, and so that'll be a, I'm sure an easier medium to kind of pour over. Go ahead, Janet. Oh, Janet, you're Group muted. Unit. On the last slide before the thank you, are those comments that people just wrote in or were they things they could pick? I, I think you told me that. I think I didn't hear it. Oh, yes. So we had a few seed ideas to get people started um, that they could vote on and then many lines for write-in. And so okay. um, some of them were, yep, were starter ideas and others were um, volunteer ideas from the public. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Martha. Uh, well, thank you, Adrian, for your presentation. And can you tell us uh, when the report will be available? And then to you or Stephanie, how it will be available? Will it be part of our resource package? Will it be uh, on the town website where anybody can access it? What's the plan for uh, when and how the report becomes available? Um, so we're, yeah, we're working on finalizing the report, so it should become available in the next, the next few business days from, from me to Stephanie. And then my understanding um, is that it'll be available to the public as a whole. But um, Stephanie, do you want to elaborate on that? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So um, both the Solar Bylaw Working Group and the ECAC will each receive it directly as part of your packets. Um, mm -hmm. I'll just make sure you all get it directly. But then um, I was talking to our communications director, and I think we'll, we may have it in a few places. I think it'll show up on the Engage website. I was thinking that it might be good to actually keep that page up and have that as a resource there. And um, it'll likely be on the sustainability section somewhere. We'll probably add it there too. So it'll and be in a few places. So yeah, that if people search for it, they can find it too. But I suggest that when it first becomes available, you know, for the first week or so when it's out uh, in public, that you put a, a notice right on the, the, the town announcements. Oh, so yeah, we'll, we, yeah, so we'll do that. So we haven't been following this, would, would know it's available. And yes. then also, you know, you haven't mentioned the uh, land survey. That's the other part of what's going on. And so when will that be available and how? So I can take that question. Um, so that actually we have our um, GIS expert is working on developing that tool still. So because what what GZA provided was sort of the base map and then our IT department is going to build on that that gives people the options to look more closely at a parcel and mm -hmm. see what things like, you know, um, I think we, you know, one of the things you had all asked about was, you know, um, soils. And so there's a USDA layer that exists that would be able to be turned on as part of that. So that just has to get more fully developed. And when we have that developed, and I think we've discussed this already, that we'll do a session during this meeting, which would then be available to the public to learn how to navigate that. But, um, and I don't know exactly when that will be ready. I mean, we have one person working on a lot of, you know, all of this GIS information. So it's a lot for him. So um, I know he's doing his best to get it as soon as he can. And I will certainly let you know as soon as it's available. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you. Great. And um, a Jack? Yes. Um, so I'm intrigued by the uh, solar canopy uh, idea. Um, and uh, obviously, we have limited, uh, you know, asphalt uh, within uh, the town that is, you know, under the control of of the town anyway. But I'm wondering uh, if, you know, if we is is there a way for the town or other to um, you know, develop these parking lots, they say the big Y or, or um, uh, thinking um, what's the uh, the former Amherst Brewery wings or not wings, but uh, where am I thinking? 
Dwayne, help me. Where Amherst Brewing Company used to be? Yeah, a hangar, hangar. In the, yes. in the victory so the, market? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so, and then uh, would there be opportunities for us to lease uh, Amherst College or UMass, uh, you know, pavement areas? Uh, to to kind of address this need, even though they're not within the juris, they're not within the area of the survey, uh, the solar assessment. But those are just some things that just because I haven't really thought about the solar canopy to the extent, and I don't think the group has really talked about it too much. Um, I don't know if you have any ideas on that, Chris or Stephanie. I haven't thought about that, um, but that's a, an interesting idea to explore. Yeah. I mean, there is certainly um, substantial adder incentive in the state program for parking lot canopy. So there is the incentive. There was a question that was, uh, there was a comment in the survey about shouldn't there be, or can the state support canopies? And they do, uh, you know, uh, explicitly, whether it's enough uh, is another question. Um, but um, so there are, you know, then it becomes a private decision of the um, shopping center or whatever um, owner of whether to, uh, uh, to to do it or not, um, and, and solar developers to find it attractive. Um, and I was just going to say, um, to follow up on what Dwayne just stated, that, you know, if it's a private landowner, we certainly don't have any authority to sort of tell them or direct them. But I think in developing the bylaw, you have sort of talked about the possibility of some kind of incentives. Or, so those might be the kinds of things you want to think about when you're developing this, because certainly they would have to look to the bylaw um, for guidance on that development. So I think that's kind of the point of what you're doing. This gives you some direction as to what the town is, you know, folks seem to be responding with that as a priority. And then how do you, um, you know, regulate that kind of development moving forward? Good. Thank you. Great. Um, uh, let's uh, uh, Janet, and then um, let's sort of focus on questions for Adrian, so she can she can be on her way when when we're done with that, and then we can go on to some of these other things that deal with the the zoning. Um, okay. but, uh, who, uh, Janet, was that you? Okay. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, I was going to support what Stephanie and um, Jack said. Is that you know you can't solve all problems by zoning. And, but I think we can make suggestions to town council about, you know, tax incentives. You know, it's one thing to say, oh, the state will give you something. But if, say we said for everybody who has rooftop, you know, you get $500 off your taxes for two years or five years or something, or um, for the big Y, I'm sure is being taxed. And so just like a little inducement to get people to do that, because really we can't require anybody to do anything, you know, except even the town. And so I think if we have ideas of other non- zoning ideas, I think we should collect those and send that to the town council because, you know, we're, we're going deep here and we should use our information and knowledge. Mm -hmm. And also thanks to Adrian. Great. And um, any other questions for Adrian before we let her go? Uh, Martha? Would it be possible to allow uh, listeners to ask Adrian any questions at this point? Stephanie, do you have any There's thoughts on that? No requirement. And I don't think we've done that in the other meetings. So it seems a bit inconsistent. I think if people have comments or questions, they can certainly um, channel them through me. But at this point, you have public comment at the end of your meeting and you have a lot of information you need to get through. I mean, yeah. you're gonna easily take up an hour um, of your next, well, you could easily take up an hour or more um, moving on to the zoning bylaw issues. I don't recommend it. I think you should keep it to where you have it in the agenda. Yeah, okay. And and certainly would entertain comments on the uh, presentation at the end uh, as well. Okay, um, with that, um, let me thank you, uh, Adrian, um, for the um, good, good work and, and presentation and useful information. Uh, and um, we'll be in touch. I'm not sure if there's going to be another opportunity for you to join us, maybe with the mapping at the end. But um, but really, thank you for for the uh, for the work for the town. Great, thank you, and thank you all for your input through this process. 
Super. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks, Adrian. Uh, all right, good. So um, let's carry on with the agenda then and get through some of the uh, sort of administrative items first, um, which would be the um, review and voting on the minutes. I We, we had the meeting, the minutes uh, in the packet from last time, 414. Um, I think the 317 minutes, are they still um, missing? Yes, they're not ready yet. Yeah, right. Okay. I think I had stated I wouldn't have them for this meeting, but I'd yeah. likely have them for the next one. Okay, great. Um, okay, so um, have people had a chance to review um, the minutes from April 14th? That was the meeting with um, Jonathan, Tom uh, Jonathan Thompson, uh, as well as uh, some other business. Um, and uh, any comments or motion to accept? Janet. Um, I had some questions and comments or like sort of revisions. Um, on page one, the bullet that says carbon flux shows steady increase in oak pine forest since 1982, hemlock decrease with HWA. I didn't know what HWA meant. Is that I'm like not a- William Delgin. Ah, okay. I think we should say that. <laughs> who said that? Okay. Right. <laughs> right. I can but see who did the minutes. Okay. <laughs> or the forester. <laughs> could you could you please repeat that for the for the minutes? I didn't catch what the what Bob said. Hemlock, woolly, adelgid. Ah, thank you. <laughs> um, and then on page two, it says something like Janet McGowan, like asks if. You know, I, I basically was asking Jonathan Thompson, are you saying that the carbon reduction benefits decrease the the greener the grid gets? And um, I, I kind of felt like that is what he said. So we should just attribute it to him instead. You no, know, so I just I just thought it was. Um, and so I just if, if we don't want to just say this is what he said, um, I think. Um, I was going to have an ad that says Thompson answers yes as to diminishing carbon benefit as the grid greens and that he hasn't looked at the carbon loss for other green energy sources. So I was going to add that in. Um, I know he had so much. I guess, to I guess I would qualify that because there was some discussion after that with regard to um, the appropriate that he was using the average emission factor. Um, and we we brought up the issue of whether it should be more aligned with the marginal emissions factor um, uh, in, in making that sort of assessment. And I think he was, uh, he, he, he said he would go back and think about that. Yeah, so I'm happy to put his words in his mouth. <laughs> and so, um, so I just wonder if that section could be more re relating what he said. And because I, it, I, when I read it, I was like, well, I'm not any expert, but it does, I'm sort of saying, are you saying this when no one said what he said? So I, does that make sense? So I I wrote I typed some edits into that, but just you know what you know Dwayne like what you said, he said isn't in the minute. So it's and it's a fine it's an important point I think. And so I I don't want to get picky, but I just thought I wanted his statements to be brought out more. Um, Janet, can and, I ask? So because you're saying a lot, yes. So can you? I think for the purpose of voting on the minutes. And the fact that you're making these amendments, I think they need to be clear. They can't yes. just be, I wrote this and, you know, we accept them. They need to be voted on as stated. So I think either, um, can you summarize them and say exactly what you want them to reflect, or we put this off till the next meeting? Um, I did write something in, but Dwayne makes me feel like maybe we need to put it off and add more. I can- well, I, but you wouldn't be adding them in. What you would be stating them to the group right now, exactly what you're saying that they should say. Okay. Okay. I'll, the I'll language that you want to use, and then they would be distributed either read aloud to the whole group so that the group can accept them as the amendments. Okay, I can do that. So why don't I, I'm suggesting, Dwayne, that we put this off because it sounds like there's a bit, and I think it's going to all get lost in translation here, and they need to be clear. Okay. 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 Um, 
Um, okay. Um, so just to be clear, what is the, the, the process then for Janet to offer some amendments prior to the next meeting? Um, I think what she could, yeah, what you could do is just um, state your suggested edits. They would have to be read at the next meeting, yeah. Yeah. Okay. you know, and then so that they would be clear and then you would all vote on accepting the minutes as amended or not because you don't have to accept them. So, but you just have to be clear about what they are okay. rather than having discussion about them. I think you need to have your suggested edits clear. I can email them to you and then maybe if Dwayne has ads, he could do that too. That, uh, that's what I was sort of suggesting too, okay. if that's, if that's yep. possible. Yeah, because I, I could then uh, potentially amend or add to what Janet has um, and then we can vote on that in totality. Yes, um, and I can, and I can, and I think then I could, uh, if we have them amended, clearly I can have them up on the screen so okay. people can see them so it's clear. Okay. 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 Great. I mean, he had he had a lot to say, so I appreciate the the effort yeah. by the minute taker. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. And um, yeah, I should acknowledge who took the these minutes. Our um, forester, right? Bob did. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Thank you. All right, great. Um, okay, uh, so we won't vote on the minutes today, but any other comments on the minutes that we should be uh, also take into consideration for next time? Great, okay. All right, so the next uh, agenda item is staff updates. Um, so um, Stephanie? Yeah, I don't really have anything um, that's relevant to this group. Uh, I think, you know, Adrian's reporting is kind of where we are in that process. I think I stated it during her presentation that the mapping is being worked on and developed and that when we have it, we will make it available. Great. Um, Chris, anything from you other than the, the, meet of the uh, meeting on the, on the bylaw? Yes, I wanted to say that the Zoning Board of Appeals held a very interesting and thorough meeting last night with a proponent for um, a battery storage facility on um, Sunderland Road. So 515 Sunderland Road, which is the location of the former Annie's Garden Center, mm -hmm. is being proposed as a location for um, a fairly large battery storage facility. And um, I would say that in general, the um, proponents did a really good job of explaining what it is they're proposing. Um, they had um, a, a consultant there that they've been using um, with regard to emergency response. Um, Captain Chris Bascom from our Amherst Fire Department was there and listened to the presentation and appeared to be and even stated that he was um, pleased with the amount of information and the way that the proponent was handling the presentation and the application. And um, so if you wanted to watch it, you could watch the recording of the Zoning Board of Appeals meeting for April 27th. I think it would be worth worthwhile watching and becoming familiar with that type of facility, even though we're not directly covering it in our solar bylaw. Um, and that public hearing will be continued to uh, Thursday, May 25th. So the zoning board will be taking that topic up again on May 25th. Great. All right, thank you, Chris. Mm -hmm. um, uh, anything else before we go to Martha's question on that? Great, Marth Martha. Now you're muted. <laughs> What's the purpose of the battery storage? It's not associated with a solar array then? It's a standalone battery storage facility, which we'll be seeing more and more throughout the state as more um, solar fields are developed. It's a way of evening out the um, load because the solar panels and the system um, take in energy from the solar arrays during the day and then store that um, energy in the batteries. And then at night, they can um, distribute it to people who need it. So it's a good way of evening out the, the load. It also helps with, um, I understand that it helps with the cost of energy since we're, uh, the, the load is distributed at a time when the energy is less uh, expensive. 
So but it helps in a number a, of ways. Yeah, but it's not a solar array that's right adjacent to it then? There's no solar array right adjacent to it. It is but in it, the vicinity of the electrical substation up on Sunderland Road, and there are solar arrays that are generally speaking in the vicinity there's one on pulpit hill road and there oh, yeah so, so anyway it's in the vicinity but it's not directly linked to those solar arrays that exist yeah but it's it something that we're seeing more and more and it's very interesting to become familiar with it and also to become familiar with how emergencies are managed and whether emergencies will occur or not so it's it's a very informative um, educational kind of presentation, I think. Yeah, they, they're uh, particularly helpful <clears throat> um, during during the sunset hours where um, as the amount of solar starts to ramp up and all that starts ramping down um, together, uh, then the, the cre that otherwise creates a large strain on the electric grid to ramp up fossil generators to make up that difference. Whereas if you can have energy storage to um, help during that ramping period, um, it's really important, uh, as well as further into the night. All right, Jack. Yes, uh, I was wondering if Stephanie could send the link to that ZBA hearing that focused on the battery storage, please. Stephanie? Yeah, sure. I'm happy yeah, to. That'd be Thanks. Excellent. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Chris. Anything else um, or questions for Stephanie or Chris? Where we move forward to a community uh, uh, committee updates. Um, Janet, is that for your committee or for? Uh, <laughs> right. I don't have much to say about my committee. Yeah, um, yeah. Christine, Chris, the new our new planning person just did a battery storage um, bylaw for where, right? And so, is he, is that he worked with um, the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission on a battery storage bylaw? Yes, he did. Okay, so. so and then so I think I have it in my my files, but if I don't, I can get it from him. You know, I actually read it in my legal like way, and it seemed like a lot of the requirements in there would be sort of repeating what we would have in the solar bylaw. And I know our charge says to handle battery storage, and I just wondered um, if we could utilize him in some way or. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. definitely. In fact, he's been the staff person who's been dealing with um, the CBA's review of this case. So it's uh, it's interesting and, um, as I said, very informative. Okay. Great. Any um, updates from the committees that some of us liaise with? Um. I'll make one announcement for ECAC, uh, more of a promotion than announcement. Um, we are holding a uh, heat a panel on heat pumps, uh, particularly residential heat pumps. Um, a panel with a um, I forget the name of the vendor, but one of the vendors of heat pumps in the area, uh, as well as a Q and A um, and some comments uh, from ECAC members on their own experiences with uh, electrifying their homes with heat pumps, and mm -hmm. that is at our Wednesday. May 10th meeting at 5.30 um, on Zoom. Uh, and the vendor, just so you know, is Scott Cernak. Cernak, yep. Yeah. I think it's Western Mass Heating and Cooling. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, that sounds right. Great. And um, if you're interested, um, is that our normal um, Zoom, Zoom link, I presume, for our meetings? It's the normal meeting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's your regularly scheduled meeting. Yep. It's another in the education series, uh, well, a little sh twist on it, but um, because it's a panel discussion, but um, it's at 5.30 to 6.30. Yeah, so it's it's uh, our meeting is 4.30 to 6.30, but that'll be the last half of our meeting. Correct. Okay. Um, any, uh, Martha? Uh, may I suggest that you email the a flyer for that to to us so that we can help distribute it. The to I can sure. do that. Yeah, that'd be great. That flyer just became available. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, any other any other uh, committee updates? Um, all right. 
good. Um, so now we have um, a good uh, hour and a half, right? Uh, what time do we go to? One thirty. Um, yes, so I know. We'll um, can I just remind you, Duane, before you launch that? I know some members expressed concern about the length of this meeting. Yeah, okay. uh, and it might be a good time to literally just take even just a couple of minutes till twelve twelve ten. Yeah. yeah. To give people an opportunity to take a quick break and grab something from the refrigerator. Um, mm -hmm. Exactly. So why don't we uh, why don't we do that? And I would suggest, and then we'll we'll jump into uh, uh, with Chris uh, the bylaw language and editing and review. Uh, but why don't we take a break until twelve fifteen, um, and be back here at twelve fifteen to to do that. Okay.
Chris, do you want to tell me where you're going to start so I can tee that up? Oh, you're muted, Chris. Did Stephanie just say something? Yes, I just asked, do you want to let me know which document you're going to begin with so I can tee it up for the group? Yeah, um, I've changed a bunch of them, but why don't we begin with um, dimensional standards and we'll talk about that. And then we can talk about the other ones that have also been changed. Okay. Dimensional standards, the one that I sent you last mm -hmm. night, um, yep. April okay. 27th. Yep, got it. Okay. Great. I, I did also want to remind people that we will stop um, promptly at um, 1, 1 um for public comment. Okay, uh, great. Uh, uh, welcome back, everybody. Um, Okay, uh, Chris, do you want to um, take us through sure. yep. um, your drafting so far? So that'd be great. Um, so I guess what I would like to mention, first of all, is that you've received a number of different sections in your packet uh, today. Um, Stephanie had sent out sections in when she sent out the agenda, and then I sent out, I think it was three updated versions last night. So you're beginning to have a more complete picture of the bylaw. And I know that there are still things that need to be added, but um, having all of those sections together, I think is going to make it easier for you to understand where we are with this, because I know that it's been a challenge. It's been a patchwork, and hopefully we can start to make a complete document now that we're, um, you know, so far ahead. So anyway, with that in mind, um, let's look at dimensional standards. So we had looked at this a while ago. I think we looked at it um, not the last time we met, but the time before that. And um, it, I was I was just beginning to think about this. Um, and I was basing some of uh, what I had done on uh, looking at other cities and towns, but um, going back and reading through the other sections of the Amherst zoning bylaw, it started to make more sense to um, to do it this way anyway. We're talking about setbacks here, mm -hmm. and I think all you you all know um, what that means. It means a structure is set back a certain number of feet from a property line. And in this case, we're talking first about the front setback. So for large-scale ground-mounted sol solar fo photovoltaic installations, the project area shall have a minimum front yard setback of, and I've changed this to 50 feet. I had said 100 feet last time. Um, I looked at the Hampshire College Solar Array on Bay Road, and that has about a 30-foot setback from the front property line. This business in uh, brackets is not something we would include in the bylaw, but it's a, a thought process that I went to went through to get to 50 feet. Um, so in any event, the solar array at Hampshire College is about 30 feet set back from the front property line. That um, right away there is a little, it's fairly wide, but in any event, 30 foot setback. Um, the, it's in the RO zoning district and the RO zoning district has a standard front setback for buildings of 25 feet. So the solar array is set back farther than 25 feet. In the RLD zoning district, that has the largest front setback of any district, and that's 30 feet. But um, in order to accommodate what we had said previously in our design guidelines, we had asked for a 50-foot buffer, 50-foot vegetated buffer. And in order to accommodate the 50-foot vegetated buffer, it seemed reasonable to have a minimum front yard setback of 50 feet. Um, now, there are also uh, town roads that um, <clears throat> are considered scenic roads, and I think I sent you a uh, link to the scenic road page on the town website um, last night, but there's a map associated with that uh, scenic road page. We don't have to look at it right now, but um, it's uh, it has roads on it that were designated by town meeting back in 1974. And I know the last time we looked at this, Janet suggested that we take out the phrase as designated by a vote of town meeting. And I agree with that. I just forgot to do it in this uh, run through. But in any event, I'm suggesting that for scenic roads that we should have a front setback that would be larger than 50 feet, that would be a hundred feet. So um, do we wanna talk about this now? 
give me your thoughts on what's in this first um, section here on front setbacks. Oops, sorry, I was muted. Um, go ahead, <laughs> Janet. <laughs> It's okay. I was a moment of peace. So I was I've been looking at um the chart that Doug Marshall put together for the planning board. We did this, Jack might I don't know if Jack was on the board when we were looking at um the solar by the solar array moratorium. Yeah. And um so I've been looking at that chart and then sort of updating it with you know badly written hand notes. And so 50 feet would put us in the kind of an outlier of you know, in, so in terms of the other towns around us, and um, so, um, you know, Belcher Town has a front setback of 150 feet, Hadley has 50, Pelham has 500, Shutesbury has 500, Athol has 200, and I think Palmer has 250, and so, you know, a, a bunch of these other towns um, made revisions to their bylaw after having quite a few arrays. And so um, when I've talked to some planning directors, I've been saying like, you know, why did you do this? And you know, in Palmer's case, um, you know, they, they, they were getting, I'm sorry, is there a lot of someone? I guess if somebody could mute themselves, I'm not sure yeah. where that's coming Chris, from. Chris, I think, Chris, it's, um, unfortunately, I think it's yours. So if you could mute okay. while you're not speaking. <laughs> So, so these are towns that had a bunch of solar arrays and, you know, that they kind of increased their setback. I know when I talked to Shutesbury, um, to Michael DiChiara, um, and this may also be the thinking of Pelham, the 500 foot setback is that they're a very forested town and they wanted to put it back so you really couldn't see it along, at, at all from the road. Um, Palmer was sort of overrun. Athol was having a lot of, they didn't want to look at the, basically want to see the, the um, the arrays and they wanted them, you know, to be screened off. And so like that, so I think 50, you know, it's a minimum, but I think maybe we should set, say like at least a hundred, cause then you could have, you know, the buffer zone and access road that might curve along and things like that. I don't know, but just wait, we just, it looks kind of thin to me or short. All right, any other comment, uh, Jack? Yeah, I was, I was thinking that, you know, if he, if you don't want solar, you're going to have it large, you know, say 500 feet. <laughs> um, and then, you know, I, th I think that some of the guidance documents there from the Pioneer uh, Valley Planning Commission and uh, the EO, EA one are, are minimal. They, they, uh, they may be as, as small as, 25 feet. I, I I remember looking at it before. So 50 is an increase from that. Um, yeah, I'm just I'm just trying to get a feel for 50 feet. Um, I think my house may be 50 feet back. Um, but I don't. I think 50 feet seems to be, you know, that that is a genuine setback. Whereas, whereas more of that just kind of gets it a little bit, you know, smaller. I think, it, 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 I think you get the effect with fifty. But I understand what Janet is saying in terms of, uh, you know, variances. Whether you start with the bigger number, and then they they're asking for, then they ask for fifty, and then then and then it gets discussed by the the decision making board. Um, but I think, I think the larger number is, is sending a, a no solar sort of vibe to it because I think visually 50 feet is, is pretty far back. A hundred is, is a very far back. I would just add, I guess, um, that 50 feet in, that, within that 50 feet would be the um screening sort of uh uh plantings as well yeah. so it's not an it's not an empty 50 feet it it is uh a 50 feet that contains some screening measures um i guess i'd also we did determine chris that the hampshire college one was quote unquote only 30 feet 
um, if, if based on your scenic road map, that's actually on a scenic road as well. Um, uh, uh, Bay, Bay Road, um, obviously this wouldn't impact already built projects, but um, um, yeah, so, so um, uh, Janet, did you have something? The other, the other point I was going to make was, even though like in RLD, you know, you have this setback of, you know, X feet, um, it's difference between like saying, okay, on a lot, you have a house that's two and a half stories and the arrays like, well, pretty much it's not like there's just a width of a house's lot of arrays. It fills up the whole field. And so, or the whole area. And so the visual impact of many, 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 many rows of arrays is greater than just having a house that's set back, you know, 30 feet from the road or, you know, 50 feet from the road. My house is actually 50 feet from my, from um, Southeast Street. And so I think if it was just twice that amount, it would do a lot in terms of screening and just kind of like a less of a visual impact overall. So it's not, it's not just like, you know, a house has a setback of 30 feet or 50 feet. It's like, this is a whole pile of rays, kind of like a it's not an industrial building either. It's something in between that. And so sort of thinking of visually, it's filling up the whole lot or whatever, you know, it's a big, it's a big looking thing. Yeah, unlike a home, it would have screening <laughs> uh, to add, add that though. Um, Martha? Yeah, okay. I mean, my my thinking is sort of either 50, 75, or maximum 100. I think my concern isn't so much scenic roads per se as it is uh, residential areas. If you have a, a patch of forest or, or farm or something that's in an area that's mainly residential, it seems that the impact on people is more than if it's just a, a scenic road that you're driving by. Uh, like, for instance, where the uh, Hampshire College array is. And so I, I guess my questions are whether it's possible to um, differentiate it all for residential areas that have more than some certain uh, density of housing or, uh, or whether we could make a limit of 100 feet but give some guidance to um, the Zoning Board of Appeals that with certain uh, discretionary conditions, they could uh, lower it to 50. Uh, but but that's the range that I feel comfortable with, 50 to 100. And as I say, my concern more is more with uh, the impact on nearby residences than just scenery per se. I mean, and let me also, um, before we go to Jack next, um, if I recall our definition of large ground mounted arrays, these are any arrays that are, are um, over an acre and I, what was it, 250 kilowatts? Yes, that's right, yep. Um, and so I'm also trying to think if there's um, any differentiation of importance um, with regard to the setback as a function of size. Uh, Cause uh, an, you know, an acre, um, I mean, a, a large setback on a smaller parcel it may just not uh, for even a sm relatively small but ground mounted project that would fit this definition might not be uh, practical if there's too much of a setback and it's the property's not that large to begin with. Um, Jack, and, and remember to put your hand down uh, after you're done your comment, unless you have another one. Yep, go ahead. Yes. Um, so, um... I'm, I, I'm just I'm just looking at, at the guidance documents, but then but the thought came, you know, when you mentioned the screening that say you have a a 30 foot tree in the end, I mean, that's going to cast a shadow that's 45 feet. So the, the 50 feet one seems to fit in, you know, maximum shadows that, you know, would preclude it from being developed anyway. Um, so it seems like a good practical number. Uh, to me, but I, and I think, you know, but I understand the mechanism where there are, might be situations where you want additional setback 
maybe based on topography or something like that, um, or you know, setting a view or something like that. But we have that. Yeah, you said a hundred um, for a Senate grow. So um, yeah, that's that's. I just want to mention the shadow thing. Thanks, Jack. Um, Janet, is that up again? It is. I was just going to agree with you, Dwayne, because I think it does matter the size of the array, and it kind of comports with the survey where people said the bigger the array, the more regulated. They, they wanted to see more regulation, and it, it does make sense that 20 acres is different from one acre. So I don't know how you write that in, but I do think you know, proximity to houses and then size of the array. And then Jack's point is topography. If you, if the land is sloping down, you're probably less likely to see it. So I don't know if Chris can get all that in, in language, but I think that would be good. I mean, is, is um, I know obviously rules like this have to be fairly um, precise, um, uh, but is there is there precedent for language that says something to the order of like 50 to 100 feet at the discretion uh, of the um, planning department or zoning the uh, zoning uh, office uh, based on site specific uh, uh, situations? It would be at the discretion of the board of the zoning board where they could waive the requirement um, for certain reasons. Um, but what I wanted to say is that we don't have very much land available or feasible, I should say, for solar arrays. About a third of our land is considered feasible based on the study that GZA did. And you'll be seeing more about that map in the coming weeks. And I'm concerned about the fact that we don't have a lot of land that you know, meets the requirements. So putting large setbacks on the projects is going to diminish further the amount of the, the area where these can go. And so that was in my mind as I was thinking about this. Thank you. Martha. Uh, yes, I'd like to follow up, Dwayne, on, on your suggestion of dependence on the size of the ray and see if we might uh, agree to, to something. Now, let me just make a suggestion for us to discuss. A suggestion would be 50 feet setback for an array of, let us say, one to 9.9 .9 acres in size and a setback of 100 feet for uh, an array was, that's greater than 10 acres in size, just as a possibility. Is that, is that type of language anything that our committee would agree on? Can you repeat that, Martha? <laughs> yes, okay. I, I'm making a suggestion here for discussion purposes that we say a 50-foot setback for a solar array of size 1 to 10 acres or 1 to 9.99 .9 acres and a 100-foot setback for a solar array of 10 acres or greater. people have reactions to that um one reaction um it, it, especially given the curiosity <laughs> and potential interest of of uh the public on dual use solar or agrivoltaics um they tend to be for for the same amount of megawatts they tend to take up more acreage because by definition they have to be spread out quite a bit, um, and so I, I just would want to think a little bit, Martha, about whether there should be, um, whether this should be more in a, on a megawatt basis as opposed to an acreage basis, uh, or if there should be something that carves out something a little bit different for dual use applications. Mm -hmm. uh, I agree to that. I'd agree to to making a kind of separate statement for the agricultural dual use case, which I think should be a separate uh, discussion anyway. All right, Jack. Yeah, I guess um, I, thinking about Martha's suggestion, 
And I, I guess I'd have to think about it. I guess um, it, it it seems like it might have a place, but it, but then again, it seems like we're not talking about we're talking about something low to the ground, basically. And I just don't know that you need more. You know, you need a hundred foot for a larger array. It, it, I'm not sure, but I just wanted to. Uh, in addition, I wanted to stress the KP law there just to refresh our memory about these this setback dis, uh, discussion that. Uh, they said, while the town may adopt specific setback requirements for solar uses, the setback requirements must be narrowly tailored, not overly onerous, or serve to unduly discourage solar installations, and C, exist where necessary to protect health, safety, or welfare. I just want to make sure we loop that in uh, on this, because this is probably one of the more important uh, sections of the bylaw. Mm -hmm. Good reminder. Yeah. All right. Good, uh, Janet. So, so this is actually like when you know when I hear about Martha's suggestion, then I think, okay, let's look at some renderings. Like, what does a ten-acre one look like versus five versus fifty? And I don't think we're going to get that out of the planning department with our current um, thing. Then I, my second thought is like, what if we, if we could, you know, if you know, can we visually, can we see some arrays that are 50 acres or 10 acres or five acres or one acre? And so, you know, that will be, instead of having a rendering, we actually have a, a live subject. So I, that would be useful to me to visualize. And I'm, I'm very conscious of what Jack just said. And then, um, and also what Chris said, which is, you know, when we get the actual GZA assessment, we're going to, we're going to be looking at parcels. Like I live next to a field that drops way down and so, you know, if you were driving by, you probably wouldn't see them from the road um, and stuff like that. So it might it might come down to I, I, I would think in a way you might say 50 to 100 feet or more, depending on topography, blah, 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 blah. And giving the um, the permit granting authority like spe specific factors to look at in terms of the um, the uh, the screening, you know, I remember very conscious of Laura saying we don't want tall trees because we don't want to shade the arrays. And one of the um, bylaws, I read a bunch of bylaws on the train this week, was very specific about screening, like, the, you know, it has to be 75% and evergreen, at least 15 feet high. But they also recognize that you wouldn't want things to keep going and going. So I feel like this might be something that we want to be specific as to factors, but give the PGA some authority to kind of look at a specific proposal on a specific site and have some discretion. But that also makes it more tricky to um, write. And then can also make it a little trickier for the developers to um, uh, um, deal with risk. <laughs> yeah. And um, channeling Laura there, I think. <laughs> okay. uh, Are we ready to move on to the next section? <laughs> yes, I, I did have one one comment on this, Chris. Uh, uh, first, I think just, and this is not a final draft, but so like w when you say for large scale ground mounted solar photovoltaic installations, that should be capitalized. So it refers to that defined term. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but then also, um, I was scratching my head a little bit in terms of for a solar project. Um, is it always clear what the front is and the sides are? Um, does that have to do with with the orientation of the of a of the road um, uh, that sort of defines what the front is, uh, and then there could be arrays that are are sort of there's road it's at a corner or something, and there's so there's roads on both sides. So is that um, what um, is there? Do we know what do we do we know what the front is? <laughs> yeah. So the front is um, the side that has the road. And if the road is on two sides, then it has two frontages. And if it's on three sides, then it has three frontages. So that would be something to keep in mind as well when you're thinking about larger setbacks. If you're on a corner and you have two roadways that you're dealing with, then you're taking away, you know, a large chunk of the property. So, you know, that's also something to consider. The building commissioner is the zoning enforcement officer. So um, when push comes to shove, he's the one who decides where the frontage is, but most commonly it is considered to be the side on which there's a roadway. Okay, okay, thank you. Yep. 
Okay. Uh, any anything else before we move forward? Super. Thanks, Chris. Okay. Side and rear setbacks for large scale ground mounted. Again, I'm um, noticing that this is not capitalized, so it will be um, ground mounted solar photovoltaic installations. I think I'll have to come up with an acronym for those. Um, the project shall have a minimum setback of 50 feet from all other property lines, and this includes side and rear property lines. So Hampshire College's solar array on Bay Road is about 25 feet from the side lot line, um, the side on the west. The properties in the RO district and the RO zoning district has a standard side and rear setback for buildings that's 50 feet. And the RO zoning district has the largest side setback requirement of any district, which is 25 feet. 25 feet, yeah. So anyway, I'm suggesting 50 feet for side setback again because of the um, need for a buffer, um, planted buffer. Um, so let's have a discussion about whether you agree with that or not. Let's see, what else did I say? Oh, this was something I picked up from Shootsbury. The side or rear setback may be waived or reduced in all districts when but abutting railroad tracks upon approval of the PGA, where site conditions allow for a reduced setback without a negative impact on screening. So that was something that they included. So what do we think about a 50-foot side and rear setback? Go ahead, Martha. It sounds good to me. Uh, maybe there there might be, you know, some some individual cases, you know, depending on a slope or some other uh, specific thing with a specific property that was next to a house that might require a change. But that, I as, as I understand, would be at the discretion of the uh, permit granting authority. So the. Zoning Board of Appeals, which would be the permit granting authority, I believe in these cases, um, has the discretion to ask for more of a setback than what is absolutely required or what the minimum is required. Yes. So if a homeowner was concerned because of the way the slope when topography went or drainage or something, they could they could appeal for a larger uh, setback. Is that right? Yes. OK, then it sounds good to me. <laughs> Janet. So are we having a 50 foot vegetative buffer around the whole fence? Is that what we were talking about last time? I'm kind of lost. And so, so would you, are you visioning like the road, the buffer for 50 feet, like starts at the road and then suddenly you're at the fence? Like that, it seems no. to me like you kind of need more space. So you know how um, a road has pavement and then on either side of it, it has right of way. Mm -hmm. So generally speaking, the right of way in Amherst is somewhere around 50 feet. So you have a road in the middle that's 24 feet, say two 12 foot lanes. So that means that on either side of it, you have um, fairly large areas mm -hmm. between the edge of the pavement and where the property line actually is. Um, mm -hmm. What would that be? That would be 26 feet. So 13 feet on either side, something like that. So then at that point is when you start the 50 foot buffer and um, or the 50 foot setback. So we could consider that you need more of a setback than 50 feet because the buffer is required to be 50 feet. And I think that's in the design standards and we can look at those later. But um, it may make sense to make the setback a little bit larger than the required buffer zone. Um, yes. Now, some towns don't have a 50-foot buffer zone. They have a 30-foot buffer zone. So we could diminish the size of our vegetative buffer in order to fit within the 50 feet. So that's a discussion that we can have about how those two things relate to one another. OK, and the, so that I think that's a great discussion. And then I was just going to read off the other town. So, for rear and side setbacks, Beltrudtown has got 75 feet, Hadley has 50, Pelham has 100, Shootsbury has 100, Athol had 200 with like flexibility on that, and then Palmer came in at 100. So I just wanted to. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Chris, in the case that a, um, a, a property owner owns two adjacent properties, um, um, would they, and they wanted to put up an array, would they then need to have sort of a, a substantial gap in between um, because of those setbacks on that property line or is that? And, yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, they'd be treated as because to separate. protect, protect uh, the, the sale of that property uh, at some, that parcel in some point in the future that that new owner would have protection? That is, that is true, unless the owner decided to um, do an A&R, which is a count combination of the properties, okay. um, mm -hmm. they would have to respect the setback. Hmm. Any more comments on this section? No, okay. All right, moving on to open space requirement. So some towns have, um, you know, a one for one um, requirement. If you cut forest, you have to then preserve an equal amount of forest. <clears throat> Some towns have uh, one and a half. I think Palmer is one that has a one and a half to one uh, ratio, and Shutesbury has a four to one ratio, which is really large. Uh, but anyway, um, in this case, I'm suggesting a one to one ratio. So for all projects where there is clearing of forest land, a minimum area equal to the total area of forest land that is cleared must remain as natural forested open space for the life of the project. This mm -hmm. natural forested open space may be on the same lot as the large scale solar photovoltaic installation, or may be on another property in Amherst or on land in a town abutting Amherst owned by the same property owner. This mm -hmm. area may be clearly depicted on, shall be clearly depicted on a site plan prepared by a registered land surveyor. The land is designated as natural forested open space shall be deed restricted for the life of the large scale so, solar photovoltaic installation. And the deed restriction shall be recorded at the Franklin County or Hampshire County Registry of Deeds, whichever is applicable. I'm recognizing that some of the towns that abut Amherst are in Franklin County and some are in Hampshire County. Um, then here's a suggestion that was made um, in answer to a question, well, what if a person wants to develop solar on his property, but he doesn't have um, land elsewhere that he could put a uh, deed restriction on? So someone mentioned the possibility of a payment in lieu. So payment of fees in lieu of setting aside natural forested open space may be allowed payable prior to granting of a building permit for a large scale ground mounted solar array. And I know that that's different language from previously, so I've got to clean that up. Such payment shall be based on a per acre cost, i.e. for each acre of forest cleared, the payment shall equal X. So we would make some uh, statement about <clears throat> what that amount would be. And the money from this payment in lieu would be deposited into a town fund held for the purpose of planting trees. I contacted um, the town tree warden, yeah. Alan Snow, and he said they do have a fund for planting trees. It's mostly for planting street trees, but it is a fund that is running low. And so they could benefit from payments of this type. Um, the fee and lieu value for each acre of forest cut shall be blank as determined by the town of Amherst assessor based on a portion of the value of the land that is to be cleared. I think that should say based on the portion of the land that is to be cleared. Anyway, what do you think of this idea of having um, the requirement for mitigation for if you cut forested land, then you have to preserve forested land. And if you don't own more forested land that you would then um, pay a payment in lieu. Um. I guess just to start the discussion, I think I, I might have been the one that first sort of suggested this idea, and and, and then there are some comments um, that I that I also noted uh, in that. Um, do we? I don't think we do, but do we require this of any other development when they take some forest land um, to build a house, to build a shopping, a commercial? Uh, um buildings um or even to 
turn forests into agriculture um, if the concept is really about trying to preserve that carbon. Um, and so um, there's something that enamors me about this, uh, but I, but I, but perhaps it should be a broader zoning thing for everything uh, as opposed to solar. Uh, and that may have some issues. Um, so that, that was one comment, I guess, for discussion. Um, if we were to go to something like this, um, um, I do wonder whether um, instead of a payment in lieu, it could be um, that they work with some some other land. Why why wouldn't they be able to work with some other landowner that it's not them, uh, but somebody else um, to put land uh, or forest land in, in preservation for the duration uh, with a landowner that that uh, is, agrees to do that. Um, but is not the individ individual landowner uh, of the solar project. Uh, in in and 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 conceivably, why why just in Amherst or adjacent areas? Um, uh, why not elsewhere in Massachusetts? Would be a question for discussion. Um, okay, um, Robert, Bob. Okay, first I'm just generally opposed to the whole idea of mitigation. So I won't be able to support this. Um, then in questions just about logistics, you're designating this as natural forest land and it's for the duration of the life cycle of the solar voltaics. And then I presumably it's released from any kind of um, restriction. And then with the payment in lieu, um, if the land is gonna be returned, removed from natural forest, does the money get paid back to the person at the, the duration of the solar in installation? I just, the whole thing is just a can of worms to me, and I don't support it. Thanks, Bob. Um, Jack? Yeah, I, I guess I um, I go along with, with um, Bob on this, but, uh, I, and I'm, I'm looking at the, the template bylaws, and I don't remember how this even kind of came up in our outline. Maybe Chris can refresh how we decided that this would be entertained in it, but I, you know, I don't see it in, in the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission and I don't see it in the EOEA, uh, you know, uh, model bylaws. And I'm sure that there are surrounding neighbors probably have this and that's you know, no doubt, but um, so yeah, this is, this is um, kind of seems punitive. Um, on a developer, but um, so I, maybe somebody can refresh me on, on wh why we're considering this. Um, I could say that we're considering it because other towns do this. And so my attempt here is to kind of put things before you and see if you think those are good ideas. Mm -hmm. And if you don't, then we'll delete it. But if you do, then we'll keep working on it. So that's where it comes from. Okay, good. Um, Martha and then Janet. You can let Janet go first if you. Okay, okay. Janet and then Martha. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Martha. So I think we have to talk about this can of worms because um, when, the, when I read this, my, one of my questions was like, well, what's forested land? Um, and so I just kind of wondered, you know, is it just obvious or do we need to define that? Um, the second one is after the survey, about the town values and what people wanted to see is a huge majority of people did not wanna see us cutting forested land for solar. And so I think the committee has to talk about that or a group has to talk about whether that's gonna be just off limits because of the many benefits of forests and all the, all the things that Jonathan Thompson was talking about and also the community values. Um, the open space plan sees the forest in North um, Amherst as a potential forest reserve. And so I think that's part, that's, that's, that's the big worm, I think. Um, and then a lot of the towns have limits on the percentage of land that can be, or like if you had a 20 acre um, parcel, only 10 acres could be used for an array or 10 acres of land could be cut. And so I, you know, I, I could send this, um, hopefully if I can figure this out, I could sort of um, send 
um, Doug Marshall's out with adding information from other towns. Some of the towns required, you know, if you're using, um, you know, agricultural land, you have to set aside 1.5 acres, you know, and stuff like that. So I think we have to like finally face the question is, do we recommend that we cut forests for solar in the face of the fact that that was a very, very strongly held um, value. And, you know, in the survey, you could see that most, the majority of people who answered that did not want to see that. Um, and the other thing, the final thing to add to the worm, the worminess, um, pushing aside mitigation issue is lot coverage. And so if you go into the different zoning districts, there's limits on the amount of, you know, how, you know, how much of the, um, your, your parcel can your building and your hardscape cover? And so when you're in RO or RLD, it's very small. And so I think that is another issue to look at. So, you know, you might want to have, you know, five acres of, if you're going to cut the forest, and then you have, you know, five acres of forest around it to kind of mitigate the impacts on that, on the, you know, the water, the wildlife, the recharge and all that good stuff. And so I think this is, I don't think we can say, yes, cut it all. And then I think we should consider saying, you know, in Amherst, we have very limited forests and we'd like to keep it. And so I think we need to talk about this quite really at length. Great. Um, Jack. Um, I'm sorry, I skipped, I don't know, Martha. Oh, sorry, sorry, I forgot Martha. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I didn't forget her, but okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, it seems to me that this is a question that we can't really make a decision on until we see the GZA land survey and really see where are they identifying. You know, if we are saying that there's one only one third of the town is not conservation or otherwise built up or something, uh, well, how much of that is forested? How much of that is agricultural land that has potential? You know, until we see that, I don't think that we can really conclude, you know, what we want to do about the forested land. I mean, I myself sort of favor the one-on-one uh, -on -one mitigation in, in some sense, but I really think that we have to see the facts first, see specifically where uh, solar is potentially possible, and then decide uh, to what extent we want to, you know, restrict the forest land or, or you know, have the one-on-one -on -one, uh, mitigations and so on. So that's my two cents for the moment. Dwayne, can I just jump in real quick with a response yeah, to that yeah, particular yeah, point? Um, so GZA's um, mapping was not definitive. If you recall, it's just where it's most feasible. So it all is going to require more in-depth analysis anyway. It doesn't mean that because it's on the map, it's it's absolutely buildable. So I just want to make that point because it's a helpful guidance, and I agree it could give you some idea, but I just want to caution you not to use that as a definitive map layer. But I assume that we are going to then have a presentation of the GZA map plus some of the overlays that, that our wonderful town staff are working on now, right? Yes, and absolutely. Yes. To me, that's the point at which we could then have this discussion. We'd be able to say, oh, it's it's this section of town, and yes, indeed, it's forested, or oh, it's got you know open fields or whatever. Uh, but I, I don't feel I can make a decision until I see all that, and I think that needs to be in our, our public uh, discussion session. Um, I guess I wouldn't mind maybe a little guidance from from Chris, maybe in terms of um, I mean the the scope of zoning. Uh, of zoning bylaws in terms of, I mean, we're not, we're, we can't zone like parcel by parcel. We're zone, you're, we're providing rules and regulations with regard to, to, to um, restrictions on, on development, but it's not like, uh, you know, in, 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 on this parcel, you're not allowed to do it on th these specific parcels. Um, it has to be um, somewhat more generic than that. So either um, the regulations apply townwide, 
or they would apply based on the zoning district that things are um, located in. They wouldn't be parcel by parcel. So you're right about that, Dwayne. Right. Okay. Um, Jack, are you ready now? <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. I, I was going to say what Martha was saying. Uh, it'd be nice to be, you know, a little, be a little bit better informed in terms of, you know, how significant would this one-to-one -one requirement be to Amherst's ability to to get any sort of substantial, you know, ground-mounted uh, solar in town. So. Um, yeah, so thanks, Martha, for that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Janet. Um, I want to add two more worms to the can. Um, <laughs> thanks to Robert, Bob, for this. So Amherst Climate and Resilience Plan and the state plan both say to protect and expand natural working lands, and their town plan says, you know, put solar on the built environment. So those are two things to kind of look at. The other thing is like way back in the beginning, I know we had talked about this and Chris had brought it up is, you know, having overlay districts for large scale solar. So, you know, after we look at the mapping, maybe we're like, okay, this is a overlay district area and this is what can happen here. And, you know, do you know what I mean? And so that might affect, if we go that route, it might affect what we're doing here too. So. Great. Um, the the um, I guess on the one on the one to one or the mitigation. I guess I just want to, you know, have us further think about what is the purpose there. Um, I you mean, know what the purpose is. Go ahead, Bob. Just saying. Um, the purpose is to preclude solar development. We know that, and that that this community survey and the, the documents that Jen, they are saying, well, we want both. We want solar, we want no carbon power, and we want forests and fields. We can't have both. Somebody has to choose. And I think canopy and rooftops are great, but that's a finite resource. We're going to have to put them in natural environments. And we, you know, we have to be able to allow that. And all this mitigation, everything else, we know the purpose is to preclude power solar power from Amherst. That's really at the base of it. Sorry. I, yeah, no, no, no worries at all. Um, I guess what I was gonna uh started to try to uh ponder is that you know if the purpose is really to make sure that we are also meeting this the um contributing to the state and town uh uh objectives of of uh protecting and preserving natural lands, um is this the mechanism to do it? Uh, there are other mechanisms mechanisms going on in town. We got a lot of conservation land. We're continuing to pursue conservation land. The states uh, will have its own programs and efforts to increase the amount of land that is preserved uh, for natural natural working lands. Um, and so, is that is that sufficient to meet our our, our collective? Uh, desires to have both um, clean energy and natural lands, um, or do we have to, it, does it make sense at all to put this burden on the solar develop or the solar developers who are trying to create this clean energy uh, to put that burden directly on them? Or is this coming, uh, the the uh, the efforts and, and um, uh, um, increase in natural working lands coming from other um, policy mechanisms? Um, is what I was going to um, put forward. All right, um, and let's keep in mind we have about ten more minutes, and we want to open it up to public comments. Um, so let's try to get. We're almost through this section, um, Jack, and then Janet. Yeah, I'm just I'm just thinking about this whole concept. Is are, are we essentially barring in terms of mitigation, barring from the uh, the the state wetland uh, regulations with regard to that resource and how that's dealt with like okay you're going to build on a wetland you got to reproduce it somewhere else so is that kind of the thinking yeah here um stephanie or chris i think the thinking here is recognizing that we do need these natural and working lands 
And if we're going to take some away, how can we make an effort to preserve something elsewhere? So that's kind of my thought process. But other but, people may have different thoughts on this. But, but don't, I mean, I'm just, I'm confused because forests, we, we, we use wood products and I, don't we need to harvest yeah. Uh, forests. I mean, our wood is has to come from somewhere too. It's a resource that's used. Whereas we don't harvest wetlands, um, <laughs> unless you like muck. Um, yeah. So I, I know I, I'm a little confused. I'm I'm definitely uh, like uh, so where Bob I, where Bob is, but I can speak to the wetlands issue a bit, Jack, and just quickly. I mean the the wetlands regulations very specifically have. Um, seven interests where they have protection over those interests. Um, it's a state regulatory guideline and guidance, and it's very specific as to what those interests are. For instance, um, protection of drinking water supply, habitat values, et cetera, et cetera. So it's very defined. Um, so I think in lieu of that, and I think it was something that I had said to Chris before was, you know, when you're doing this exercise, what are the resources that you are looking in the community to protect, but why? What do they offer as value? So I think you have to not just say we like forest. I mean, that's kind of a given, but what are the things, what are the reasons why you need to preserve that? Is it, you know, absolutely fundamental that you preserve those for a specific reason? You know, I think that's the kind of discourse you want to have. Yeah. So on that, so you know clearing a for it has to be an amazing forest track <laughs> so I, I can imagine like boy you're going to take down this particular like old growth forest you're going to need to you know mitigate that something you got to like preserve something for your you know eternity uh but all forests are not created equal so there's there's a real this is this is uh you know, we really need to qualify when we even kind of consider that a particular force that has uh, some special value. I, I don't think all forests are created equal, and and we do need wood. There, there's a harvesting, and there's there's owners. You know, <laughs> that that we're going to get in legal trouble too. I think with uh, going down this path too. So, in terms of uh, you know, owners' rights. So. Um, thank you. Thanks, Jack. <laughs> Great. Um, uh, uh, Janet, and then and then um, uh, scroll down seven. I think we're at the at the end of this section, aren't we? Or is there um, a little? Yeah, yeah. Okay. There's a bit more on it. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. So I have to express some frustration. Um, and and you know, we have a climate action and adaptation and resilience plan that literally says what natural lands do are forests, wetlands, farmlands, grasslands, and soil store and sequester carbon, drawing it down from the atmosphere through processes like photosynthesis and microbial activities. The, when these lands are developed or degraded, not only does the carbon stored in trees, plants, and soil get released, but the future capacity of that land to sequester carbon is significantly and often, often permanently limited. Therefore, protecting our natural lands is one of the most important things we can do to mitigate climate change. And then it also talks about the ecosystem services of air and water quality improvements, flood mitigation, cooling on hot days, local food production, and more. Um, healthy, undisturbed natural systems can better withstand or adapt to the impacts of climate change and should be prioritized for protection. I mean, this has all been decided by the client, our own town's plan all of these ideas are in the state action, the two of the state climate action plans. And it's not saying we don't want solar and, you know, it's saying we want forests. And so, you know, where should we put solar? Well, let's put it on the mine in, you know, the Holy, you know, on, you know, that's when it's, when it's at a thing, let's put it on lands that are already degraded. Let's put it on very marginal soils and not on prime farmland. This isn't something I'm making up. This is this is the result of the thinking of the ECAC, the town council, state, people like Jonathan Thompson. You know, so I don't think it's, I mean, 
I don't know. I just feel like I, you know, I read all this stuff and I present it and I just don't feel like people are absorbing it. You know, wetlands are phenomenally important in terms of ecology, but also in terms of sequestration. And, you know, Massachusetts was one of the leaders in adopting a wetlands act before, you know, it's just, am I, do, do have people read these plans or am I, you know, I just don't, I mean, we, this has been decided by our by our action plan, and so if we're saying don't cut down forests because of these things, we're just implementing the plan adopted by the town council and written by ECAC. And if we, you know, where can we get solar? We don't need to get, you know, solar on every part because we have the state, the universities, and the college, you know, picking up the tab for forty five percent. We have hydro, we have wind power, we're going to have solar, we have you know, a tremendous amount of people have solar on the rooftops. You know, we can, what are our goals? Well, the plans tell us the goals are to do both. Yeah, Chris, you had a... Uh, oh, thought. I just wanted to say, I think we're going to need to face the fact that we will need to cut forests. But I think that Janet is also right that we need to preserve forests. And I would love it if Janet would write up what she just read as part of a nexus statement, which would support us in requiring that there be mitigation or a fee in lieu or some compensation for cutting forest. If you, if we value forest so much based on our climate action CARP plan, then we can require mitigation, one-to-one -one mitigation. We, I think we need to figure out how to do it. And in order to support that, we need some kind of nexus statement, which is very close to what Janet just read. So I think we can work together on a compromise here and allow some forests to be cut. If forests are cut, we have this um, mitigation and we have support for it because we're going to write a strong statement as to why we value forests. That's my opinion. Yeah, I would. Uh, I would just offer um, a couple things. One is, you know, when ECAC wrote that, it wasn't to suggest that. We Oops. Oops. Sorry. Shit. Jack, I cut out. I mean, Dwayne got cut out. Sorry about I that, Dwayne. Out. Yeah, no, no, no <laughs> worries. Okay. Um, uh, uh, when when you know ECAC put that together it was um it was not to suggest that we shouldn't build solar um uh and potentially look face confront this trade-off between solar and forest it's what that we 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 recognize as everybody does that uh forests provide all of these um services uh carbon including um that uh Janet had read had uh, had articulated or read off from from the carp report um, it wasn't to suggest that ECAC's position is that we should not consider uh, using any forest land for solar. Uh, it, these are the trade-offs. Um, and um, um, I guess the, the other issue is, I, again, I, I'm not sure why we're um, zoning should call out solar in particular with regard to this issue uh, of, of um, development in forests. Uh, and then second, um, as we do need both, and both provide very important public goods uh, in terms of climate benefits. Um, why is it is it is it appropriate to quote unquote penalize or put in on an extra burden on the solar developers to do this mitigation, um, or should there be um, more of a mechanism to um, um, make that uh, um, socialize that cost? Uh, as we as a society develops more solar potentially in forests, other land and, and have some some mechanism through the state, uh, through the town to 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 provide that mitigation. Uh, it just seems like we're we're um, we're we're um, penalizing the other good parties that we want the solar developers to to uh, to develop solar that we need at scale uh, by adding this extra burden uh, directly on them. Hey, okay. Dwayne, what what what's the report that you and Janet are referencing again? It's um, the ECAC's um, CARP report, um, uh, which is climate, climate action. action. 
adaptation and resilience plan. Yeah. Sorry, Doreen. Yeah, I just right. thought I'd get it yeah. for you quick. Yeah, I appreciate it. <laughs> it was adopted by the town council as a town's plan. Well, they, yeah, adoption is, I don't think they ever specifically adopt plans. Um, they kind of approve them, but they they're very clear about their language about around that because we had wanted them to adopt it, and we got some pushback about that specific language. But however, they did support it. So, um, and and my point that I made earlier was to what Chris just said was really the point I was trying to get to is that what Janet is referencing is exactly what you should be doing. Like if you're again, if you're identifying these things as priorities, then you need to reference the documents that have been published in town or some of the actions that have been taken in town to protect these resources. That that's all I was saying earlier. So Janet, you're, you know, what you're what you're doing and saying is is, you know, a, a pathway that makes sense. Okay, great. Um Jack, is your hand up again? Oh, I, I'm just I'm just looking for it on the web here, and uh, but yeah, Chris I, asked that it be sent to all of us again. Just uh, I'm surprised yeah. I don't have it, but I'd like to have it again. I summarized it in a memo I sent, and I can resend that, and it has links to the different plans, okay. so I could send that at them. Okay, thanks. Okay, and do keep my NECAC is also, you know. Um, uh, expressed um, its op opinions or thoughts of, of the need for solar development, uh, obviously um, considering, uh, highly considering the built environment first, uh, but then also some assessment with regard to um, wh what, sort of, what sort of scale of development we might need to consider or want to consider for the town, which is, uh, we'll see with the GZA map, but likely above uh, the amount that can fit on the strictly on the built environment. Um, let me, um, if okay with everybody, um, and we have one more short section on energy storage, but maybe hold that for next time because I do want to give um, any of our public participants um, an opportunity to um, offer some comments on today's discussion. If any members of the public are interested in making a comment or asking a question, please raise your hand. Eric, you can go ahead and unmute. Uh, thank you, Stephanie. Um, uh, I appreciate uh, the earnestness which um, we all are struggling with the solar um, placement of solar um, in our community. I am have to say I'm, uh, as Janet McGowan expressed just now, I'm equally frustrated and dismayed by um, the the uh, effort to kind of um, kind of measure the the what the town values, what the community values, and um, in terms of the environment and the placement of solar, and the disconnect that when the rubber hits the road, the discussion um, on um, where we should put solar uh, that that occurs um, in in the solar bylaw working group. Um, uh, discussions. So I have to say that it's the disconnect between what the survey pur pur purportedly was to reveal about what the town values and what and how that gets implemented and crafted into the solar bylaw is kind of stunning. I also would like to say that um, there was another kind of survey that was created in the form of the Amherst Town Master Plan in 2010 that went through a kind of a, a, a very long and elaborate process that came up with how much the town values the natural and cultural resources. And I could go into um, the strategies for, um, uh, for conserving the land in sufficient uh, uh, quantity, but I would su suggest perhaps that we look at and add to the discussion what in the form of the the uh, master plan, the the community in 2010 valued and what and in, it was adopted in 2020 by the town council. Um, and finally, I would also like to just um, uh, represent one of my neighbors. I live on Shutesbury Road, and one of my neighbors regarding set. This is a regarding a setback issue. His well 
head is right on his property line. And just on the other side of his property line was the beginning of the proposed solar array that was proposed in 2018, 2019. And I would say that if you're, uh, it, so one, I'm not suggesting you're cavalier, but there are real life issues at stake here, not just about visibility, vi vi visual um, uh, aesthetics. This, this is a water issue right on the border. The bed um, wellhead is right there. So I think it's not, it's this, this um, kind of uh, very uh, difficult um, uh, discussion really needs to be this, this uh, labyrinthine discussion really needs to be had because they're real lives at stake here. And so I do appreciate the, the, the concern and the, and the, the, the kind of, um, kind of the, the difficult conversations we all are having regarding these subjects. Thank you. Okay, Steve, you can go ahead and unmute. Great, thank you. Um, this is Steve Rowe from South Amherst on Southeast Street, um, speaking as my own person. Um, when some folks have summarized the both the Amherst plan and the statewide plans, they, they kind of, I've heard it sounds to me like they're implying that saving forest is the most important thing to do to fight climate change. And that's wrong. The most important thing we need to do is stop burning fossil fuels. That's clear in the Massachusetts plans, all those plans and the Amherst plan. One of the next important things to do is to preserve as much working land as possible. Um, but remember, working lands at best are absorbing only 10% of our carbon emissions. So they're a small sponge trying to mop up a huge amount of pollution. So I think the priority has to be to get rid of fossil fuels. And that means turning to renewable energy and the renewable energy that we can build out in the next couple of decades is wind and solar. Maybe beyond a few decades, there'll be other alternatives, but that's what we need to develop now. Um, Amherst has done really well with that land preservation goal. We have at least 30% and it may be closer to 40% of land within Amherst is already permanently preserved. And um, maybe after I'm done, Stephanie or Chris can confirm that number. So we have actually kind of achieved even what is proposed in the 2050 plan, which is 40% of um, land area and water, land and water in Massachusetts be preserved. So we've achieved that land preservation goal or very close to it at least. So we've done a great job on that front. What we haven't done is produce that renewable energy so we can stop burning fossil fuels. Um, and as we've pointed out, or as Duane has summarized, uh, it doesn't take much land to do that, one to 2% of land area. So you know, keep that in mind. We're, the, the proposals are one to 2% of land to generate renewable energy, and we can still have that 40 plus percent land preserved. And another thing about, remember the fossil fuel impacts, it's not, just about global warming problems. It's about health related problems. So there are hundreds of thousands of people affected every year in Massachusetts by fossil fuel pollution. That's the particulates, it's the poisons released to the air. And there's billions of dollars of costs in terms of healthcare costs and lost labor and, and shortened lifespans, all associated with that burning of fossil fuels. So, I mean, it's a huge, huge health impact on us right now right now and um, that's something we we need to get rid of and those renewable energy sources will do it there'll be an impact on the landscape but it's not going to kill hundreds of thousands of people or cause billions of dollars of damage as our fossil fuel burning does now so thank you very much okay and renee moss you can go ahead and unmute hi um I sort of don't know where to start. Um, there have been so many good points raised, and I have so many and so many questionable ones. I I want to just thank Janet so much for reminding us of the the carp. It it's so important, you know, um, that um, 
Amherst has, has made these statements and we have to honor them. And I know Steve Roof just mentioned how um, there's nothing more important than developing more renewable energy. I want to remind everyone about the 2030-2050 um, roadmap that Martha has presented to this committee that shows there are four pillars and all four pillars are important. And, you know, we, we can't do one without the other. And it's really, um, um, it, 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 I, I think we have to have a broader perspective. Um, in terms of the mitigation, which I, I, I think mitigation is an important issue. Um, I think Dwayne said that we can't penalize solar developers. Well, for solar developers who are, you know, these are multinational corporations, it's the cost of doing business. And I think that, you know, all businesses, um, there's the, there's the, the, the cost of doing business when you're doing something, and this is part of the cost. And maybe it's about, you know, if there's 40 acres that you're looking at, only 20 can be developed because that other 20 is preserved. I, you know, there are many ways of dealing with that, but, you know, I feel like this committee needs to be here to, to hold and to protect the this, this, this safety, the welfare, the general well-being of our residents, and, you know, to be looking out so much for, you know, um, protecting the solar developers who are, you know, it, it, there's nothing wrong with making money, but that's what they're there to do. So they will be able to to weigh, you know, you know what what makes the most sense for them. So I hope we're seeing this through the lens of protecting our residents and not through the lens of um, protecting the solar developers. Um, and I also the other little thing that I uh, that I wanted to to talk about is, and it's been mentioned, it's how do we think about this without having these maps in front of us? How do we think about how do we move forward? You know, I think Chris mentioned a third of the, maybe only a third of the land, a third of Amherst land is has potential for solar development. Well, you know, a third of the land that that's a lot. So maybe we. I mean, it feels to me like we're groping in the dark. And I feel like as a member of the public who, as you all know, I've, we've been very involved all along. You know, we read all this. We read the CARP. We read all, and we want to see those maps. And I, I know Chris refers to them. Stephanie refers to them. But we haven't seen them. And if we really value the public like we say we do, we can't just disregard the results of the survey. Why did we spend all this taxpayer money to hire a consultant if we're going to ignore the results of the survey as to how people feel about it. Um, anyway, I, I think that's it. Oh, and one more thing. I want to say a fee in lieu, in, instead of mitigation, a fee in lieu of, of mitigation, to me that makes no sense because the reason we want mitigation is because of the sequestration and the power of the forest. So if we have a fee where we can plant a few new trees, that doesn't replace it at all. That's not mitigation from my perspective. Thank you. And thank you for working so hard on this. I know you all are. And I know we all have the best of intentions. And um, we'll get to the other side of it. Thank you, Renee. Anyone else want to make a comment or have a question for the committee? Okay, All right. not seeing yeah. any hands raised. Seeing none, and we're at time. So um, uh, any final thoughts or comments from the members here? Go ahead, Martha. Yeah, our agenda for next time, are we going to talk about that? Uh, I mean, it seems... I think you can just assume that everything you didn't get to this time is going to be covered over, carried over to the next. There's quite a bit. Yeah, I think it's, it's material. Been... Yeah, I'd like to say I, I see two important things that I'd like our committee to do over the next month or so as we try to get this all put together. And one is really a, a good informed session on seeing the maps. We could, you know, project the GZA map, see what areas they said, and then project some of our zoning maps or our conservation maps or, you know, compare them and uh really get to the nitty gritty of that. I would like to see that be uh, one of our big uh, agenda topics as soon as the maps are ready. 
you know, whether that's next time or the time after. And the other is uh, something we didn't talk about today, and that is for the farming. You know, we've talked about dual use, and that certainly is intriguing and has possibilities and so on. And Dwayne, I know you're at UMass, it's being worked on, but I think we really need to understand what our local farmers need. You know, they don't raise sheep that you know, can happily graze under solar panels. <laughs> they raise cattle or they need to have their tractors uh, to mow the hay fields or you know, they have their orchards, whatever. So I, I really think we need a session where we hear from a few local farmers as to specifically what their needs are and whether dual solar is, is something that's even appropriate for them before we write any specific section of the bylaw referring to the agricultural lands. So those are the two things that I would like to see uh, over the next month or so. So thanks. I think, thanks, Martha. Um, Jack? Yeah, I was just wondering, you know, we, we keep comparing to, you know, bylaws prepared by uh, Shutesbury, Pelham, Palmer, all these other towns. Now, have they done the, the type of solar survey and assessment and things like that, that that we're doing here in Amherst? Because, you know, again, Amherst is different, but I just, I'm wondering what those towns have in terms of, uh, you know, available areas that aren't locked up uh, with regard to being, you know, protected areas and things like that. And we're, we're going to have a very good sense of what we can do. And I'm just wondering if the other towns really bothered to do that stuff. Good question. Do we have a question from the public? Um, I see Eric has his hand back up, so maybe we'll do that and then we, we can adjourn. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Dwayne. <clears throat> My question concerns the state survey, solar siding survey that's supposed to be released in July and how that will correlate if there is any correlation between the survey that GZA has done with this with the survey that the state is doing. I don't know the level of detail at which the state is approaching it, but you would, I would think that it would be an opportunity to fold that survey into the GZA survey. Uh, Dwayne, if I could. Yeah, please. Yeah, I think they're they're looking at different um, exclusions and criteria. It's not an apples to apples, so it wouldn't. I mean, there might be some information that can be gained from it, but they they're not the the same. They're not looking at it in the same way. In fact, even just the the level of detail at which they did the analysis isn't the same. The scale, if you will, isn't the same. I originally thought their report was going to be available by the end of April. Uh, has it been postponed? Dwayne, do you know? Because they were doing not only the, an online survey, but they also were doing a whole report on solar siting. They were do they're doing a GIS mapping of the whole state. Uh, um, uh, but I don't, I, I don't have an update on when that's going to be available. I heard, I heard April too, which I guess they have like a day. But maybe <laughs> May. work hard over the weekend. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Very good. I think we want to, you know, certainly spend uh, time. I think th these types of more robust discussions of of the worms we need to uh, get into. Um, is uh, is really helpful for us. So I think we can continue doing that as as uh, uh, Chris uh, sort of takes us through the drafting um, and and then uh, and work on it, work through it that way. Um, so I think that will be the bulk of the agenda. Next time we'll be uh, continuing uh, to um, work with Chris on on the drafting. Um, I the the map. I'm quite confident the mapping from GZA won't be available in in two weeks. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, what about the farming then? We could talk about that at some point. Yeah. I think we can talk about it. I'm not. I'm just not that keen on on, uh, um, you know, unless you have some recommendations of of um, uh, of bringing in specific farmers. I, I know we can bring in some experts on dual use uh, that sort of work on dual use. I can talk about what I what what I know and what the state is doing on dual use um, or agrivoltaics, uh, but um, um, 
I could bring some, I have some farmers and I definitely know at UMass, um, is it Dr. Hebert who's been working on the, it'd be great to have come in, to come in and talk. Um, I wouldn't necessarily um, uh, recommend him, but he, he, we, we certainly could, but I'm, I'm quite familiar with what's going on um, yeah. at, at UMass on, on, on dual use and, and in the state. I'm I'm more concerned about you know trying to really understand what our local farmers grow. I mean, I see some orchards around now. Do they want to consider putting solar over their orchards, or is not that not feasible at this point? Because if so, then it has the solar panels would be really high up, and we would have to have in our zoning. We would be asking about limits, or do they grow vegetables? And if so, do they want to crawl around underneath to harvest the vegetables, or would it mean really spacing the solar panels or? Well, the, the state, I mean, for- uh, That's, that's the kind of things I, I need to picture if if we want to say anything about dual use in our zoning. Well, right. I don't think oh. farmers will know um, yeah. too much about it yet, uh, but, uh, or, or some some will, but relatively few. Um, but um, there's a whole guideline on dual use that for eligibility for the state um, there's a whole guideline uh, that's very specific um, with regard to um, what a solar array needs to look like and 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 do uh, to be considered as dual use and get the uh, incentive that dual use is provided in Massachusetts. Um, I can speak about those issues. Yeah, maybe. I mean, maybe I that's just, what we need. I don't know. Well, Martha, I agree with you because I often wonder you know, looking at the size of farms, if we have any farmland that's big enough for dual use and also farming. So like I went over to Brookfield Farm and I was like, how big is this field? And it was three and a half acres. They they actually have 50 acres of land that they cultivate. They leave 15 resting and they have little fields all over the place. And I don't, you know, we're not like the Midwest where the field is like a square mile. So is it really feasible to do dual use here with, with smaller plots that are very yeah. fertile? Is yeah, it? there's projects in uh, in Hadley that have small dual use farms. Uh, one of the notable companies in Massachusetts that's doing dual use um, uh, agrivoltaics on small scale is located in Amherst. Um, uh, so um, let's get let's get let's get that info in. Let's let's talk to those people. That'd yeah, be great. Maybe that's what we need to hear about then. But, but but maybe we could maybe we could have a session where we could, you know have a couple of the these types of experts uh, come, but invite farmers to, you know, listen in and then give them a, a chance to do a little Q&A at the end or something like that. Maybe. I, I, I'd sort of be more inclined to uh, start getting through some of the uh, bylaw language that we need uh, to understand what sort of questions uh, we might want to um, pose to the farmers uh, for some nuances yes. that we might not be able to uh, figure out ourselves. Yeah. Okay. Okay, um, we're over time. So uh, thank you everybody. Um, uh, we will be back in two weeks uh, at our normal starting time, I presume, Stephanie, um, mm -hmm. at 1130. And um, just as I'm doing that, I'm making sure, yep, it looks good to me. Um, okay, uh, so very good. Um, and we'll, um, uh, one thing is, Janet, you're going to just update the minutes or make that amendment to the minutes and share that. Um, and then we'll be good to uh, approve minutes next time as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. Oh. With that, thank you, everybody. Um, and have a good couple of weeks and see you in a couple of weeks. See y'all. Right. Yep. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.